Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Last day on Friday, I taught you about electric field lines. I just want you to know that in the physics education community, there's a healthy uh, discussion going on, uh, an argument, if you will, about whether field lines should be taught. Electric fields are already invisible. They're imaginary. They're hard to kind of get your brain around. And then we have these field lines that are a representation of the electric field. So they're an abstraction of an abstraction. And many of my colleagues feel that that's one bridge too far. Now, what I hope to convince you of today is that once again, Greg is right, and they are wrong. <laughs> um, they argue that it, it costs so much effort to find the field lines, you have to have a computer, the computer has to grind away at the formulas, the computer has to look at every single point and, and map it out, that it's not worth it. What I'm going to show you today is that we can find field lines using this idea of symmetry. Now symmetry means if the problem looks the same when I look in a mirror as it does when I don't look in the mirror, then the answer should look the same when I look in the mirror as it does when I don't. If the problem looks the same when I stand on my head as it does when I stand upright, the answer should look the same when I stand on my head. Now folks, when I say problem, I mean charge. Okay, the source. When I say solution or answer, I mean the field lines. So that's the way we got the field lines for a spherical uh, charge distribution. If I have a point source, I notice that that problem, the charge, looks the same when I rotate my head by 30 degrees. It looks the same when I rotate my head by 60 degrees. It looks the same no matter how I rotate my head. It has that spherical symmetry. And that means that the answer, namely the field lines, should also look the same when I tilt my head 30 degrees or 60 degrees. It should also have spherical symmetry. And what we found was that the field lines went out every direction, evenly spaced. It had the same symmetry. So I like this uh, far side. Uh, one day, Wilson, I'll be sitting at that desk, and you can't tell the two desks apart. You know, it's just, what are you trying to get at here? When you say it's an abstraction of an abstraction, do electrical fields actually exist as a field, or is it just a way for us to understand the forces being applied? Well. When they were invented, uh, electric fields were just a gimmick to, uh, to help us to calculate the electric force, which is what we really care about. And then, when we started looking at radio waves and other types of electromagnetic radiation, we found that it was actually the changing electric field that gave us a changing magnetic field, that gave us a changing electric field, that gave us a changing magnetic field. And in this way, those, those waves were able to move through empty space. My sound waves, ha! Sorry. <laughs> yeah, good song. <laughs> the sound waves have to have air to travel through. If we suck all the air out of the room, I could try to make noise, but you wouldn't hear it. In space, no one can hear you scream, okay? But if you send light, if you flash a, a flashlight in space, they see it. If you send radio waves, they, they hear it, uh, if they've got a receiver. And so what we found was it started out just a gimmick, but dang if it did turn out to be true. It's a real life thing. <laughs> Let's talk about this problem that you voted off the island. It's really quite straightforward. Um, I have a set of electric field lines, 
And remember, electric field lines tell me where, where the room is stinky, where the electric field is strong and where it's weak, where the field lines are close together, that's a large electric field. And where they're far apart, that would be a weak electric field. Now, these field lines are missing the arrowheads. And the arrowheads tell you which direction along the field line the electric field vector points tangent. In other words, at point A, I can have a, a vector tangent this way or a vector tangent that way. And that direction would be determined by whether the uh, arrowhead on the field line is one way or the other. And they're left off. Now what we are told is that the thing that's flying through the area, the region, is a positively charged test charge. The thing that's being pushed is positive. Now, the thing that pushes is the electric force. That's the thing that's real, that, that we can feel tugging at things, okay? And that's equal to the electric field scaled by the test charge. Now, if this electric field is to the right and the test charge is positive, then the force, the actual push, is going to be in the positive right direction, which is just right, okay? And so for positive sources, the E field direction and the force direction are always the same, are always the same. Now, I see that this particle as it flies through the region is veering to the right. And that means that when it gets to A, this vector must be the correct one, and this one is incorrect. And that means the arrowhead is going to be this one here, and the other one is just a mistake. Now, neighboring field lines have to be going in the same general direction. Okay? And so that would be uh, the way I put the arrows on that, those field lines. Now, the electric force at A, B, and C um, I've drawn the electric field at A. The electric force would be a vector in the same direction. Okay? Now, I don't know how long to draw that. I just made that length up. But I know that at B, uh, the field lines are a little bit closer together, and so the force would be a little bit longer. And at C, the field lines are even closer together, so I would have a force that was even longer. Okay? Now, I, I usually don't like to work the problem that you just turned in. But this problem is almost identical to the last page of your tutorial homework that's due tomorrow at 5 o'clock. And I want you to, to understand how to do that homework problem. It's a very important homework problem. Um, this problem 18 has a source, a negative point source, that's located right there. And we always keep our sources from moving. We, we nail them to the sky or we glue them to the table. But we never let those sources fly away. And what we're asking is, what's going to happen to the field at the X if I bring a large metal ball that's neutral and put it between the source and the X? Now, first of all, let's pretend that this metal ball doesn't exist, or that it's not here, that it's in a different country at a different time, okay? And we just want to know what the electric field of the X looks like due to that negative source alone. Would it be away or towards that negative source? Towards. Towards, always towards 
a negative source. Now we bring the metal ball and we put it back there. And because it's metal, the electrons in the conductor are free to swim to their happy place. Now if I've got a negative source over here and electrons are negative, they want to get away from it. They're repelled by it. And so they swim over to the right and that leaves naked protons all by their lonesome on the left. So now I have three charge distributions. I have the original point charge that's nailed to the sky, and then I have these charges that are really just a charge separation by the electron swimming to one side. Now the electric field, the total electric field at the X, is due to all three sources, all three Klingons, okay? I already have the field due to that negative point source. I also have a field due to the electrons on the right and a field due to the naked protons on the left. Now you'll notice that, um, that I didn't draw the arrows the same length. I drew the dark blue arrow longer than the, the green arrow. And that's because these electrons are closer to the X than the positive charges are to the x. And because the distance matters, it goes as 1 over r squared when my charge is concentrated, um, this will be bigger than that. When I add all three of these together, I get a result that is bigger than the original electric field without the ball. So by putting that neutral metal ball between the x and the original charge source, I strengthen the field. I make it larger. Check to see if your neighbor got that right. Otherwise, uh, tell them how sorry you are. Spacing here is further apart than there, so I'd have a weaker field. And that third location, they're really far apart, so I would have the weakest field. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone? Is that clear? Okay, yes, sir. This isn't really related, but I see vectors on your tie. Uh, what's your tie say? Oh, this tie is all about the apparent weight, which is the topic of 205 today. And so uh, it also says wrong or sick and wrong. So, <laughs> if you want to stay uh, for the 205 class, we'll be talking about my tie. Okay. Now, up until now, we've dealt with charges, source charges, that are points. And when they were points, when we had... Uh, charge speared along a rod, we broke the rod up into points and we used superposition. Well, today we're going to continue that, but this time we're going to look at a charge that is smeared over a surface uniformly. In other words, if I take this table and I paint it with charged paint, and I paint every little inch of it with charged paint, careful to make it the same thickness all the way across. Now, that thickness we call the surface charge density.
we give it the symbol sigma, the Greek S, and the units of that are coulombs per meter squared, or for each meter squared. So if I take a meter stick, and I look at an area that is one meter by one meter, and I add up all the charges in that area, that's how big sigma is. Now, what this represents here is a charge that comes out towards you. Okay, cuts you right in half. Okay, okay, it goes right over the top of the front row here. And it goes back into the room behind. And it goes left and right forever. Okay? And we, we imagine that as just the extension of this table. Now, I claim... I claim, your name, sir? Steve. Steve? I claim, Steve, that that's what the field line looks like, the first field line that I've put on here. Does that seem reasonable to you? No. No. And the reason it doesn't seem reasonable is because we don't uh, see the same answer, but we do see the same problem. I look at the charge and I see a great big surface of charge out in front of me. It just keeps on going. Steve looks and he sees the same thing. A big old surface of charge going out in front of him. But when I look at the answer, the field line, I see up and to the right. What do you see, Steve? Up and to the left. Up and to the left. We can't see different answers if we see the same problem. So that means that the only possible answer that Steve and I can agree on is one that goes straight up, okay? Now these uh, dowels, I bought 23 years ago, uh, back when uh, Kmart was still open before they closed last week. Uh, <laughs> and they've seen better days. Uh, some of them are broken and taped back together and they bend a little bit. But just imagine that goes straight up perpendicular to the table. Now, if the second field line is like this, and if I claim that the third field line is like that, Steve's going to have a problem with it again. Because I look and I say, hey, the field lines are getting further apart as I look to the left. And Steve says, no, they look like they're getting further apart as I look to the right. So that means the only answer that Steve and I can agree on, due to symmetry, is if they're evenly spaced. And indeed, if there was someone standing here, they would want to see them evenly spaced as well. And so I will try to make them evenly spaced in all directions. I'm not very gifted spatially, but I'll do my best. Okay, and so imagine this table covered with, uh, with field lines so that no matter which direction you looked at them, they were evenly spaced, okay? And that would be the field. It would look like that. Now, I painted this charge on a table, but the table's just a placeholder. It's just holding the charge. It's charge that creates electric field. And I could have used a, a big sheet of saran wrap uh, just as easily as a table. And so by symmetry, I should have field lines down there going away. Away from a positive. Away from a positive. Now folks, this field, this parallel field, is an approximation. In real life, we don't have sheets of charge that go on forever. And if we're away from that sheet of charge that's finite, the field lines curve like that. However, there's an entire branch of physics called surface science that happens very close <coughs> to surfaces. <coughs> and there are just a huge number of, of applications where we stay away from the edges and we stay close to the surface. And in those cases, we have what's called 
the infinite sheet or infinite plate approximation. Okay, the infinite sheet or infinite plate approximation. Well, how do I know when I'm when I'm that close? Well, again, I love the far side. Face it, Greg, you're lost. Um, if you are close enough to the surface, you know, imagine yourself an amoeba right down here. And you look out and you see the, sh the charge is just going on forever, like the Sahara. It's just, whoa. And you look over here, whoa. And you look over there, whoa. Every direction you look, it looks the same. That's close enough. That's close enough. Now, let's get to the, the guts of today's discussion. If I tell you that the electric field of this X has a value of 5 newtons for each coulomb, it's that big, and I ask you how big or how strong is the field of that X, would you answer that it is larger, the same, or smaller than 5 newtons for each coulomb with your clicker? Okay. Remember what an electric field is. It's how hard I would feel a push on one Coulomb test charge. So what I'm saying is if I put one Coulomb here, it feels a force of five newtons. If I put that same one Coulomb there, would it feel a force that's bigger than five newtons, equal to five newtons, or less than five newtons? Uh, do you have your answer? Okay. <laughs> These people are lost. These people are just goofing with me. It's these two groups I want to talk to. Okay? I've divided the class roughly into half. And these two groups are believers and unbelievers, or infidels. Okay? <laughs> Believers in field lines or unbelievers in field lines? Okay. The believers in field lines. Why did you say that it would be the same? At equal spacing. Equal spacing. The spacing tells me how strong or how stinky the field is. If I got the same spacing there, I got the same field. It's got to be exactly, exactly the same size. Now you unbelievers are saying to yourself, that's crazy sauce. I mean, <laughs> it's further away. The further away I get from a source, the weaker the field. Twice as far away as a fourth as strong. If the source is a point source. But this is a new animal. And I'm going to convince you, I hope, I'm going to try three different ways. I'm going to convince you that the electric field near a sheet of charge doesn't depend on distance from the sheet. I get exactly the same field there as I get here. Let me try the first way. Whoops. The first way is to say, what if I covered up that positive sheet. You can't see the sheet. What's causing the field lines? Is it a positive sheet down here or is it a negative sheet up there? What if it's a negative sheet up there? The field lines would have to be going towards on both sides. But if I had a negative sheet causing these fields, wouldn't you want that one bigger? The one that's closer to the sheet? Yeah, you would. So if you don't know what's causing the field, you just say, oh, I guess I don't know which one's bigger. It depends on what's causing it. And if I get the same field lines from both of those charges, I should get the same ranking. Okay, that was my first attempt. Give me two more kicks of the can, okay? Now, what we find is that near a plate of charge, or a sheet of charge, the V field does not vary with the distance from the plate. And what we find is that for a single sheet, 
or a single plate with charge density sigma, the E field strength is dependent on the sigma, period. I divide by this constant that epsilon naught is called the permittivity of free space. You'll never need that name unless you go to a geek party, okay? It happens to be 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb square over Newton meter square. Again, you're not going to need that. It will be on the front page of the exam. Are we still talking about just when we're right at the surface, the microscopic level? We can use this formula if you're close to the surface compared to the distance to the edge. If it's a meter from here out to the edge, and I'm a centimeter or two from the surface, it will be this value. Okay, so that's the way we uh, use this approximation. So is it that there's no difference in strength, or just that the difference in R would be so small that it becomes insignificant? As long as we're in that regime, yeah. but whether you want to say it, it's, it's so small that we can't measure it or there's no difference, it's semantics at that point. And you couldn't use it on a larger scale of like the surface of the earth. Good, yeah. If, if, I, if I could charge up a surface like uh, the size of this campus, then we could be, you know, 100 meters from the, you know, as long as that distance is it's small compared to... A singular charge. Right. Is there a formula for that? Yeah, ratio? Yes. If that's... L and uh, and that's D. I'm, I'm looking from the top down and on the side. D would be much less than that. Which is the same as I said with my mouth, which works. <laughs> okay, there's that permittivity of, of free space. Okay, now for point charges, the electric field strength varies drastically with distance, uh, twice as far as four times as weak. Okay, and that K value we've seen before and again and again and again. Now I told you that I was going to take three kicks at this can. I've only taken one kick. So let me try again. This time, I'm going to take this sheet of charge, and remember this green line is only a line because I'm drawing on a two-dimensional screen. In real life, it would be a sheet that comes out and just cuts the class in half here, okay? Now, in the past, when we wanted to find the field due to a, an extended charge, we've broken it up into uh, small bits. Now, in this case, instead of small clumps like peanut butter, I'm going to cut it up into slats, like in a uh, basketball court. This would be a, a wood slat that comes out forever and goes in forever. And this would be another wooden slat that comes out forever. And these wooden slats are charged. Now, if I take a little positive test charge and I put it right here close to the sheet, I can look at the contribution due to several of those slats. Now, first off, these two slats here are fairly far away from my test charge. And when they push on the test charge, they're pushing in a direction that's almost opposite. So when I add their contribution, I get a very small contribution. They almost cancel out. On the other hand, if I look at contributions from here and here, I get bigger forces because they're closer and they're pushing in more of the same direction. So when I add their contributions, I get a huge contribution. Now here's the game I'm going to play. I'm going to say that the charge within a cone 
of half angle 45 degrees is going to be the most effective charge for pushing on that test charge. Okay, the charge in here, the charge in this half cone, okay, so if this is my sheet and I've got the charge here, I'd take a half cone 45 degrees in all directions and there would be a circle of charge that would all be pushing in pretty much the same direction. Okay? Now, if I move that test charge further away from the sheet, two things happen. First of all, the charge that's pushing is further away. So the push is weaker for each bit of charge. But the second thing is that if I look at that cone of angle, half angle 45 degrees, the cone that pushes in pretty much the same direction, I get more charge in that cone. Now, it turns out that these two effects cancel each other. By moving this test charge twice as far away, my push by each little bit of charge gets smaller by four. But also by moving this twice as far away, the amount of charge that's pushing gets bigger by four. And so suddenly, the two effects cancel each other out. See if your neighbor is a believer now, a believer in field lines. <laughs> okay. That was the second kick at the can to convince you. Let me try one more time. Uh, a little while ago, a friend of mine, Jack Drumheller, passed away. Jack was a professor here in the department, a, a, an outstanding teacher, a master teacher. He was also provost of this university for many years. He was also a pilot uh, during World War II. And what he told me was that uh, during World War II, when pilots were shot down over the Pacific, they prayed for bad weather. And this is why. When you're shot down over the ocean, you come down with your parachute. The last thing you want to do is arrive at the water with your parachute attached. Because what's going to happen? It's going to come down on top of you, it's going to get wet, it's going to drag you down, it's going to drown you. So what you want to do is as you approach the water with your parachute, when you get 15 feet away, unbuckle your parachute, drop the last 15 feet, swim away, and let the parachute land not on you. Here's the problem with a sunny day. With a sunny day, there's no waves. With a sunny day, you look out and you see flat ocean everywhere. When you're 100 feet up, you look out and you see flat ocean everywhere, as far as the eye can see. When you're 15 feet up, you look out and you see flat ocean everywhere you can see, as far as the eye can see. It looks exactly the same at 100 feet as it does at 15 feet. And the problem that they had on sunny days is that pilots would panic not wanting to be trapped by their uh, parachute and would release themselves from 100 feet, fall 100 feet and break their legs, and then they can't swim away. <laughs> Or at all. And, and so what they prayed for was a storm where they could see waves and they could say, hey, I'm about two waves high. Time to bail out. Okay? Did I convince you? Are 100% of you believers in field lines now? Check that your neighbor is a believer. <laughs> Okay. Now, without a computer, we just discovered the field lines due to a charge, di a charge distribution that's very common in laboratories and in physical situations that are dealt with in science. And because of those field lines that we found, we learned a very special property about the field. 
near those surfaces. Here's a sample problem. This is one of the three homework problems that's due on Wednesday. I would encourage you to pay attention. We have a square plate with sides that are two meters on each side. So if I draw that over here, I have two meters by two meters. If I draw that on a side view, it looks like this. Now, we know that the charge density on this thing is positive. And we know that on the entire plate, we have 65 microcoulombs. That's given. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a particle, a little <laughs> test charge, and we are going to float that particle at one centimeter above the plate. And the charge on that particle, it's a test particle, <coughs> is going to be plus one nanocoulomb, or one times 10 to the minus nine coulombs. And what we're looking for is how massive should that particle be, how many grams should it have, kilograms, in order to float there. Now part A asks you what's the electric field one centimeter from the surface of the plate. What do I do with that one centimeter number? How do I use that? You ignore it. You ignore it because the field is going to be the same one centimeter above the plate as it is two centimeters above the plate as it is a half centimeter above the plate. You ignore it. So in order to find the electric field strength at that location, I need to know what the sigma is. How thick did I spread this peanut butter? I take the total charge of 65 microcoulombs, I divide by the total number of meters squared, which is four, and I get how many microcoulombs are in one meter square. The actual number would be 16.25. I just round it, round it down. I will not be rounding your grade down at the end of the semester. Okay, we only round up. Okay, now if I plug that into our formula uh, for the electric field, we get this number here, 9.2 times 10 to the fifth newtons. That's a lot of newtons. But remember, that's the force that would act if I put one coulomb there. Well, I'm not putting one coulomb there. I'm putting one nano coulomb there. So I'm going to get a small, small, tiny fraction of that push. Now, if I look at a free body diagram for that particle, there's a weight force down. There's an electric force up that's caused by the plate. Now, folks... Here's the big picture. If there was one important takeaway today, this thing here is what you care about, the force, the push. And it's given by this formula regardless of how you got your electric field. If the Klingons were concentrated at a point, you use this formula. If the sources were spread over a surface, you use this formula. But no matter how you got your electric field, you multiply it by Q, the test charge is being pushed, and that gives you the force, okay? So this force is just the electric field that I just calculated times the test charge. And since the test charge is one nanocoulomb, or 10 to the minus nine, I multiply this by 10 to the minus nine, and I get 10 to the minus four. Are you with me? It's not rocket science. We did that last semester. Okay? Now, in order for this particle to float, we have to have a weight equal to the electric force, the electric push. Now, the gravitational pull, the weight force, is equal to the mass times gravity, which on this planet is 9.8, let's call it 10, 
newtons for each kilogram. So what I'm looking for, that mass, is the number that I would have that if I multiplied it by 10, I would get that. And so that gives me a mass of 9.2 times 10 to the minus 5 kilograms. If I multiply this by 10, the minus 5 becomes a minus 4. Okay? Check that your neighbor's on the bus with that solution. Now this is essentially what happened with the Mickelson oil drop experiment that earned the Nobel Prize. The Mickelson oil drop experiment floated little droplets of oil above a, in an electric field to find the charge to mass ratio of each drop of oil. And then they used that to figure out the uh, charge to mass ratio of, of the electron. Now, uh, the actual experiment was not done by Mickelson, but by his graduate student, uh, Harvey Fletcher Sr. Um, turns out that graduate students can't get the Nobel Prize. They're not fully alive yet. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay. Now, part C. Part C asks, what if I go in with tweezers and I move this little particle up to two centimeters? <laughs> will it drop back down, will it float away, or will it stay at that new location? Stay. It will stay. Because this electric field doesn't depend on how far away you are, that means this electric force will not change, and that means I should have the same mass to balance it. So it will just float wherever I put it, as long as I'm close compared to the distance to the edges. Okay? Now. One more big idea that you need, and that is that almost never, very rarely, do we have a single sheet of charge. Typically what we have is two sheets, one positive and one negative. And the way we create that is we usually take two metal sheets and we hook them to a battery. And when we hook them to a battery, that battery takes electrons from one of those plates and puts it on the other. And then it takes another electron and puts it over there. So for every electron that I end up with on this plate, it leaves a positive proton behind on the other plate. And so I end up with a negative surface charge here and a positive surface charge there that are the same size. Well, what does that look like? That's the more common situation. If I use superposition, I'm going to have at that x a contribution due to the positive source, the positive plate. Remember, this comes out forever. And I'm going to have a contribution due to the negative plate. Now, folks, notice that these are the same size even though the X is closer to the green sheet than the purple sheet. Distance doesn't matter. Okay? Now it doesn't matter whether I do it at this location or that location, I get the same size contribution from the uh, positive sheet and the negative sheet, and everywhere between those two sheets I get the same total electric field. Now if I look outside the sheets, I have a contribution due to the positive sheet that's away from the positive and towards the negative. Again, distance doesn't matter, so these two are the same size and cancel. Okay? Now the question is, how big is that electric field? If I think of the contributions, each of those contributions is given by this formula for the single sheet. Now, if I take this combination, sigma over epsilon naught, and I rename it apple pie, okay, that combination is apple pie. When I add those together, I have half an apple pie, half an apple pie plus half an apple pie. What does that give me? 
a whole apple pie. Are you hungry? Yes. I am. Okay. Now, that's the formula that we use more often. It's the field due to two sheets. But it's not just any two sheets. It's got to be a plus sigma and a minus sigma where these are the same size. And that's going to be sigma over epsilon naught. And I only use the formula to find the strength. The field is away from a positive towards a negative. Now, I would represent that field like this. Between the plates, I have field lines that are parallel meaning I have the same size field here, as here, as here, as here. And outside the sheets, I have no electric field. I represent that with no field lines, okay? Now this starts to look very, very similar to where we've been before. If you turn that upside down, it looks like the gravitational field in this room. Everywhere the same size, everywhere pointing the same direction. We'll build off of that the rest of the week. We're done.